Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We welcome you to the house of the Lord as we give Jesus our worship and praise. And thank God for each of you. Did my mic just jump up? Yeah, it's a delay. Got it done. Not a whole lot in your bulletin. Uh, of course, next week, uh, even though it's early in the month, we will recognize the Reformation. And then uh, uh, the Sunday after that, All Saints Day on November 1st, which is All Saints Day. Um, also, uh, they do have the Zone Festival next uh, Saturday the 31st. Uh, the world will call that Halloween. We call that All Saints Eve. Um, uh, so a bit, a bit down the road, two weeks. Um, anyway. Let's go ahead and start uh, this Sunday with 940.
On this, the Lord's day, being the 20th Sunday after Pentecost, we make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you. And for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Therefore, go forth in his name and sin no more. Amen. Amen. We enter into worship the introit with Psalm 121. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, the protector of all who trust in you, have mercy on us that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal that we lose not the things eternal. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. We continue with the reading of the Holy Scriptures. Good morning. Good morning. The Old Testament reading this morning comes from the 45th chapter of Isaiah, verses 1 through 7. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of kings to open doors before him, the gates, the gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. 
I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson comes from the first chapter of 1 Thessalonians, verses 1 through 10. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the gospel. The gospel message comes from the 22nd chapter of Matthew verses 15 through 22. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle Jesus in his talk. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are from, that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully and you do not care about anyone's opinion for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Randy read, I am the Lord, there is no other beside me, there is no God. 
We all met that with our confession of faith, explaining our confession about God and professing using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for the sermon in number 781. We give thee up thy own. Grace, peace, and mercy to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. In the Old Testament reading from Isaiah, we have God speaking to Cyrus, who wasn't a Jew, wasn't a Hebrew. He was a foreign leader, but yet Isaiah 45 reminds us God is an active God. He works throughout the world, even with those who do not know him. In the epistle text, Paul, beginning his letter to the Thessalonians, who later we'll see 
thought Jesus was going to be here tomorrow for them. And Paul having to straighten that out. But in the gospel text, which is the sermon text today, we continue with Holy Week. And again, we find ourselves in Matthew 22. And since coming into Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday, Jesus has moved with urgency as he immediately came into the temple in order that he might cleanse it all the while continuing to heal the blind and the lame and the lame and surrounded by children revealing his identity to be that as the son of David and just as Christ is diligently working this holy week in his final hours we see the devil is also actively working on the hearts of those who oppose Jesus in the debate, and it is sort of a debate in our text, Jesus is the center of attention here in these short verses. But it's his ultimate desire to be the center of attention on Calvary's cross. That's where he and will be in three short days. And in that light, this debate has eternal consequences for the listeners. For it is the Lord's desire that everyone listening would know God's righteous law and become aware of their own sin and recognize and cling to Jesus as the promised Savior who will pay the ultimate debt for mankind on the cross. Truly, the time for Jesus' preaching is running out. The crowd has gathered among the pillars and the stones of the temple area. And Jesus is there. For the city is full of pilgrims preparing for the Passover feast. And the multitudes have heard of this man. And they've now gathered to hear him and to see him heal the sick and to hear his preaching. For many are coming to faith in him by the power of the gospel. And of course, this is a big problem for the Pharisees. They want him silenced. They want him dead. And they seek a way to trap him into breaking Roman law. Christ's presence in the temple offers a forum for this attack. Jesus here have the, the opportunity to turn the crowds against Jesus by flexing their supposed muscle of their positions and their assumed wisdom in all things. Here they may safely challenge him and prove him to be a false prophet. And they plot the assault in the text. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle Jesus in his talk. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully. And you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Well, it sounds innocent enough, doesn't it? It's an invitation to wholesome debate about whether a faithful Jew can render taxes to Caesar and still be obedient to God's job, God's law. By the way, wise men will tell you, never get involved in a political discussion when visiting members of your family. Because we all know those family debates can be divisive. In fact, remember the first presidential debate this year but yet debates can also be illuminating. There are actually some good debates through the history of mankind, especially the truly memorable ones. However, for those of us who are older, we know that rarely happens. Yet do you remember in 1988, during the vice presidential debate, there was a line you might remember when Senator Benson said to Senator Quayle, Senator, I served with Jack Kennedy. I knew Jack Kennedy, Senator, and you're no Jack Kennedy. This line was met, of course, by applause by those who favored 
Senator Benson. But in the end, it didn't convert the opponent. And it didn't convert the voting public either that year because the other side won the election. And by the way, the answer to that insult was, that was uncalled for, received almost as much applause from the audience as the original insult. However, here's a zinger that did work. While receiving some tough questions from the press during the Desert Storm conflict in the 90s, General Norman Schwarzkopf found himself debating with a reporter, surprise, as to why he didn't look to the French for more military support. Growing tired, the general offered this, going to war without the French is like going deer hunting without an accordion. Insulted, but not converted. The reporter didn't ask the general any more questions. These short examples show quick wit in the heat of a debate. But they do not show how a wise debater is trained to stack the deck in his favor by deploying the tools of the trade. And the compliment is one of those tools. Compliments, of course, change the tenor of confrontation. Think for a moment as to why we give compliments. Why would you compliment your mother? Well, to show her you love her and that you care about her and you appreciate everything she's done for you. Why do we compliment our friends? Well, to show them that we're glad they're our friends and that they mean a lot to us. But in debates, a compliment has a different purpose. In today's gospel text, a compliment is being used in a very subtle and careful way because it is filled with evil and deadly intention. We have the disciples of the Pharisees and several Herodians, that is, the people who supported King Herod and who were allies of Caesar, the Roman emperor. By the way, both groups were enemies of Jesus. The disciples of the Pharisees were visible in this encounter, while the Herodians seemed to be standing in the shadows. And they greet Jesus with some really nice compliments. In fact, not only are the compliments nice, but they're true. <laughs> Teacher, we know you are true and teach the way of God truthfully. And you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearance. True statement. Well, surely because they're speaking the truth, such flattering words that Jesus will consider them as friends and will now speak openly and freely to them. Teacher, we know you're true and teach the way of God truthfully. Indeed, these are true words. But then remember the beginning of our text. The Pharisees were plotting to trap Jesus with his own words. In fact, this isn't a debate about a wholesome desire to understand God's law. It's all about discrediting Jesus. The text tells us, Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Instead of accepting their words as kindness, Jesus reprimands them and calls them the wicked hypocrites crits that they are knowing full well the evil of their words. Jesus remember he's the very son of God and he knows the dark and evil intentions of their hearts. They speak this way to trap him to trick him to th into thinking that they are his friends so he will break Roman law. And so they ask him the Big question. Teacher, tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? It's a gotcha question. And it's a loaded question. Because many among the Jews believed that paying taxes to Caesar was against God's will. And that they shouldn't be forced to do it. 
but also remember who's nearby, the Herodians, and that Herod was a puppet of the Roman government. So the Herodians believed that taxes to Caesar must be given. And anyone speaking against taxes was a traitor to Rome. If Jesus speaks against the disciples of the Pharisees, he'll show himself to be a traitor to his own people, to the Jews. If he agrees with the disciples of the Pharisees, the Herodians will have open cause for his arrest. But then, in fact, it would be lawful to kill him under Roman law. And in this way, the dirty work of the Pharisees would be accomplished by the Herodians, the hands of Caesar's loyal subject, King Herod. And what happens here? Jesus reprimands them and harshly calls them, you hypocrites. And yet, in love, Jesus answers them. Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, well, Caesar's. And then Jesus said to them, Therefore render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar, and to God the things that are God's. Jesus shows them that since Caesar's image is on the coin, that we render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. However, he also tells them, Render unto God that which is God. That is being faithful to God because ultimately in your sermon hymn gave you a big clue. All things are God's already. The text tells us, and when they heard it, this answer, they marveled. And they left him and went away. They marveled. These students of the Pharisees were amazed. And is it possible that in that one brief moment, free from the influence of their teachers, that these men heard the master teacher and recognized in him more than a skillful debater? Might they have actually seen in him the one, the only one who could really render unto God that which God desires, a heart and a life of perfect love and obedience to him? who is the head and rule of all authority. Might they have grasped that this amazing man would render unto God everything demanded for their salvation in just three short days? Might they have actually believed in him and be saved? Or was this amazement only the teeth-grinding admission that they had been bested by this amazing man. The scriptures don't tell us, so we don't know. But we do know that as we go forward as the people of God, we pray that we will always be strengthened to see in Christ the ultimate work of his rendering unto God on our behalf. And that receiving the benefits of his passion, death, and resurrection, we may be enabled to always render unto God all that which is his. Amen. Now may that peace of God, which does transcend all human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus this day and every day. Amen. We continue with the prayers. We rise for prayer. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray this day for our city, for Mayor David Holt, for the city council, and all city workers, 
as well as all who serve in our surrounding communities, that you would guard and protect them all and guide them into all things which are well-pleasing in your sight. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Heavenly Father, we continue to pray for all who are battling on the front lines of this virus pandemic. We pray for all our doctors and nurses and all medical personnel and for our first responders, our firemen, our EMTs and our policemen and all who continue to respond to all disasters. Guard and protect them in their duties now and into the future. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Heavenly Father, you know the hearts and the minds of all. You know those who are sick and those who are shut in and those who stand in need of your care and comfort. But today we pray especially for Ivan Smith, for Lon Keister, for Harvey Norris, for Anna Warnke, for Paula Montgomery, for Stephanie Ruth, for Pastor Louis Keneve, for Pastor Barry Hinkey, for Jim McCright, for Cordova Kastner, for Pastor Mark Erler, for Dwayne Osmus, for Glenna Fuller, for David Henry, for Jimmy Gray, and for Alice Ramsey. We pray your spirit's comfort to be upon each of them, O Lord, that you would guard and protect them in the days and weeks ahead, and that if it be thy will, you would grant healing to the sick and comfort to the afflicted. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please be seated.
They can drink the blood of Christ, get on the Catholic cross, for the forgiveness of your sin. and drinking of the true body and blood of your Lord and Savior strengthen and preserve you steadfast into true faith, to life everlasting. Go in his peace and continue to serve the Lord in gladness. Amen. As we pray, O God, the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament, and we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled to serve you constantly. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now, dear friends in Christ, as you go forth this day and every day, May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord always look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Please be seated. We close with him 818. 